Well, welcome to this uh, session on homelessness and countdown to Christmas as part of the Reboot Open Lens series at Westminster. Uh, starting a new uh, autumn season, the countdown to Christmas will have a particular salience for those who are facing either the risk or are uh, homeless. And we're joined today by uh, Alex Bax, who is the chief executive of uh, Pathway, which is a homelessness and inclusion uh, charity. Mm -hmm. and I think he would emphasize the word inclusion. And he's going to talk about the countdown to Christmas. Uh, this year, the Homelessness Reduction Act comes into force. A variety of mayors uh, in London, Birmingham and Manchester have made very strong promises on what mm -hmm. they think they can achieve. And uh, they may find those promises quite challenging. So, um, Alex, over to you for some introductory remarks and then we'll have a conversation. Th thanks very much, Neil. Um, thinking about what to say today, I, was, I thought I'd start with our experience at the front line. Pathway as a charity does a number of things. One of the things we've done is support the creation of specialist homeless teams in hospitals. So we have teams who work with us in 10 acute trusts. What, we've, what we glean from those networks is what's happening for people admitted as an emergency to hospital and what's happening if you like, at the very bottom end of British society. And I guess one of the messages I want to share from this morning, thinking towards Christmas, is that things aren't too good out there, putting it mildly. Um, so at the extreme end, there's some work going on with Channel 4 and others looking at counting deaths on the street. Deaths on the street seem to be rising. Deaths are rising. There's wider evidence about health equity and, and whether our, our progress towards narrowing gaps between rich and poor has, has certainly stalled in the last couple of years and would it look like it may be going backwards. But what we also hear about um, what's happening in the lives of people who are near or close to the street is that services across the board are struggling to respond to their needs. Um, long, the the long-term austerity program of the government is really beginning to hurt, I think, is what we would say. So, for example, we see um, drug services getting worse and becoming diminished, and that in the end can lead some people into hospital. We see probation services in crisis getting worse from the client's perspective and in the end when there's a failure in probation that can lead someone ultimately into, not only onto the street but into hospital. Um, the wider housing crisis we see continuing and again when your housing status breaks down catastrophically and leaves you with nothing that can in the end lead you into hospital. I was going to mention Windrush and all of that, but again, a harsh environment for migrants leads people ultimately to be excluded, catastrophic excluded. And in the end, when you leave people with nothing, they will get sick and they'll end up in hospital. From our perspective, of course, that's not only awful, but it's also very ironic because in the end, the hospital is the most expensive, one of the most expensive parts of our whole system of, of public services. An acute emergency admission is not a good thing for anybody but it's also for society a very, very expensive thing. So Christmas is coming, not looking great out there. However, I did have some, I had some things we are looking forward to or, or trying to influence which, which offer some sparks of, of hope or opportunity for, for homeless people and for the, for the organizations working in the homeless sector. You mentioned one of them. Um, the Homelessness Reduction Act, new piece of legislation, interestingly, a private member's bill passed last year, coming into force. Um, the next tranche of powers coming into force in October. Um, part, part good, part question mark in our minds. The good part is, and at the heart of the legislation, is, is an effort to change the attitude, particularly of local government, towards people approaching their services who are homeless. The shift being away from can I assess you in such a way as to qualify you out of my responsibility towards we are a local authority housing department. You are, do appear to be homeless. What can we do to help you? Now, that's a real important shift. It doesn't magic up any additional housing units, but we're certainly seeing in some local authorities that change of culture is shifting the way housing departments respond. Not everywhere. At the same time, very interesting, but quite soft duties for public services to refer people at risk of homelessness to each other 
from our perspective, some new duties on the NHS to refer in to housing people we think or suspect might be homeless. Again, as the legislation went through, people wanted this to be a duty to collaborate to support people who are homeless. It's only a duty to refer. It hasn't gone live yet. Quite a lot of activity to see how that works. We'll see. Underneath the Homelessness Reduction Act, again, as with so many things today, the real problem, the real complaint for local government is there's not really any money. And it doesn't do anything to replace the large-scale cuts that local authorities have faced over the last, well, the austerity period. So that's, so that's one part bright spot. The second thing people may have noticed over the summer, the, the government published a rough sleeper strategy. Again, glass half full, hugely welcome to see a strategic cross-departmental look at these issues of homelessness, although they've called it a rough sleeping strategy. Cynically, some of my colleagues are, are possibly calling it the make them all go away before Christmas strategy, because a lot of it is about diminishing the numbers of visible rough sleepers. That seems to be the government's priority in this document. However, again, within it, there are some jolly good things. So there's a strong focus on rapid response to people in crisis, particularly on the streets, which has to be right. There's a strong focus on integration between services, joining up the way services respond. And they've also backed heavily a thing called Housing First, which is a way of trying to, where you can, get someone who is vulnerable, has perhaps some complex issues in their lives, into housing as rapidly as you can. And there's some new money there. So that's a good, a good thing. Again, lots of gaps in it, lots of things we would wish more of, better, but it's a, it's a start. And there's a promise from government that it will be followed by a wider homelessness strategy. The third area, and again, we're glass half full optimistic that we may see some, some um, positive things coming from it, is Simon Stevens, the chief executive of the NHS's deal with the government to get £20 billion of new investment into the health service. We've been working quite hard to influence that. In the rough sleeper strategy, there's a strange statement that, that the government has asked NHS England to spend £30 million on services for homeless people. Um, we're hopeful that, that not only some bits of pilot money like that can be levered into the strategy, but perhaps a response from mainstream health and it's now social care as well. Health and social care services have a big part to play to respond to homelessness. As Pathway, what we have been spending the last five, six years doing is assembling an evidence base to show what health services can do to help. And we now have a rich evidence base of things which, in our view, should be being done nationally across all services, but actually at the moment are only, only active in, in places where there are enthusiasts or, or leaders. We now need to see this, the health service generalise its approach to homelessness. So there you go. There's three optimistic views in a, in a wider, gloomy context. And when we think of uh, the sort of countdown to Christmas, the homeless that we are thinking about are, and hardcore is not a fair description. The description is people with complex and multiple needs. So quite often their homelessness is not just an economic priority, it's that they have mental health issues, that they have other types of health mm -hmm. issues that make uh, the, their lives dysfunctional. Yeah. Um, the sort of official guess to make has been that there's anything between four to five thousand a night because mm. it's a snapshot figure on the streets. Crisis say that they think that figure is closer to nine thousand. Mm. But that's the end of a spectrum. Above them are the sofa surfers. Yep. I've had to learn these terminologies when I've been mm. working with you and your colleagues. And then above them are what most people imagine as the homeless. That is families, families with children who don't have a house over their mm. head and are being put in temporary accommodation. And the, the figures there are 78,000 families, possibly up to 200,000 children. Yeah. And th that uh, is undoubtedly mm. the local authority priority whenever children are involved. Yeah. And I'm, it's, so the hard, but the, you're saying there are lessons at the hard end, which if learned can not only improve yeah. people's lives, but yeah. dare I, inhumanly say it, 
save money and improve, improve the effective use of public sources. I think that's absolutely right. There are, there are two, we'd say there are kind of two angles of lessons. There's some lessons from the practice of specialist homeless health services about what you do for people who have reached rock bottom and are in that position. And by the time you've been marginalized in your life to the extent that you're spending time on the streets, you will have incubated, you're very, very likely to have incubated a whole set of needs and problems in your life, particularly from our perspective, chronic and acute health needs. But as you said, a context of poverty, of exclusion, kind of burns through people's lives. The parallel point, as you say, is that is if you look at the lives of people who end up on the streets, this is not a random chance event. Crisis did some work recently which showed that if you're a middle-class boy from middle-class parents with a degree living in the home counties and you've reached 30, your chance of experiencing homelessness in your first 30 years of life is less than one in 200. If you're a single mum living in South London on benefits the age of 30, your chance of experiencing homelessness in your first 30 year, years of life is two in three. This is a routine experience for people at the bottom of our society, and it is a scarring, harmful experience. So we know that, that anything other services can do to head people off from edging towards the streets must help. It will help people in their lives individually, and as you say, it will store up fewer problems for the future. And with the, the changes in the benefit system, uh, and as you're saying, the impact of austerity and the squeeze on some of the services that were there to help. Are there signs that there is more trouble coming down the pipeline or that uh, you know, some of these issues and numbers can be improved? So, what we, so yes, what we see and what we hear is that, yes, there is more trouble both coming down the pipeline or in a way there must be given the harshness of our, of our social support services these days, that, um, that at the same time our colleagues working in hospital report seeing more and more people with more complex needs. So it does appear that the need out there is, is being multiplied. It's, it's not unexpected if you see what's being ha happening, for example, in universal credit, as you've penalised people, punish them, take their money away. If you make poor people poorer, they are going to get sick and, and worse stuff will happen to them. And in the end, that will lead people, for example, into hospital. The other place people often end up is the criminal justice system, of course. Um, so, yeah, we are seeing more. There are still some services which support people out there, but I think a lot of the stuff, again, if you talk to some of our patients, the things in people's lives which so often help people are some of the soft social infrastructure in our society. Things like libraries, things like parks, the capacity to go to a gym or a club, Every time money is put in the way of accessing those kind of services, every time stigma is, challenges you to cross a threshold because you feel unwelcome, you're investing in someone heading towards uh, misfortune and Now, you illness. do specific pieces of work with hospitals with accident and emergency, yeah. um, trying to tackle the revolving door where homeless people are presenting to the health service with... Uh, complex needs created or made worse by their homelessness, but you know they get treated for the leg ulcer, mm -hmm. yeah. or they get treated for their TB. They go out the door, and it's not mm -hmm. a solution, and they're back. Yeah. They're given drugs that don't get completed. Yeah. And just describe the work that you're doing with hospitals that are at the sharp end of those, and particularly the A and E, because I think that's something that's not well understood. Well, A and E is a, is a complex environment in itself, and is, a, is, if you like, one of the very extreme ends of the health service. So, what what we did to start off with was was come up with a model of a, of a homeless team in a hospital. We actually started with a focus on patients admitted to hospital, because you have more time. There's no four-hour clock ticking. You have a little bit of time to engage with the individual and to engage with all the services that might help them. And a key focus for those teams is to try and get a better resolution, a better onward transfer of care for that individual, such that their chances of returning to the street are diminished. And the, the episode of hospital care becomes a positive intervention in their life, rather than one more crisis event in a life full of crises. Um, the support we begin to offer to A&E, that is, once you've got a solid team in place, you've got some expertise on homelessness in your hospital. Again, A&E is under pressure. The consultants are the fundamental decision is admit or discharge. If the, patient, if the patient's going to be discharged, there's not very much you can do from a homelessness perspective 
in the short term. But some simple things you can do. You can be nice, you can show some empathy, and you can have at least some advice about where to go and what other services are available. Now, having said there are lots of services which have gone, there are still services out there which are accessible to people on the streets. So if you can support um, A&E colleagues to make reasonable and non-onerous referrals, you also perhaps, very often people are coming to A&E as a cry for help. It's the last place they can get to. If you can begin to shift those relationships, the next time the person comes in, and again, for example, our team at UCLH quite often are called over to A&E and then begin to create a relationship with the individual from the street and can begin to engage with them about their problems. One of our insights is to always start with the issues the patient wants to deal with, not to bring your own issues, but to try and go where they are. Now, the government's strategy is uh, to half the number of rough sleepers by 2022. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's observable that, I mean, in the old days that would be uh, the, like saying that the poor are always with us, mm. that there is uh, an element of homelessness that uh, is, is almost permanent uh, in the sense that the causes, whether it's mental health or addiction or other things, will keep pushing mm. some people out for reasons that are not economic. What's, what's your view about the interventions that need to be made around and, and about that assumption? So our first view would be that we would dispute that we think homelessness is, is an issue. We could, it, we're abolitionist in intent. We think we could abolish homelessness to the point where the numbers are vanishingly small. As you said, there are crises happen in people's lives. If somebody's relationship breaks down, they end up sleeping in their car. What one needs is a society which picks someone up in that position rapidly, gets them away from the street. And we look at some European colleagues who have achieved this, more or less, so there are virtually nobody on the street in some European countries because they've invested thoughtfully over the long term in services. So we don't accept that they are always with us. An illustration of that point is that the biggest cause of homelessness today is the failure of a private rented tenancy agreement, not mental health, drugs, alcohol, or complex needs. It's the fact that housing is too expensive and people cannot afford it. So it's quite simple. Homelessness is, is amongst other things, a lack of housing, and our housing system is really, really broken, particularly for people with limited financial resources and particularly at the bottom. Now, the government have allocated uh, 30 million. Obviously, if that's spread across 78,000 families and 200,000 yeah. children, that won't go very far. But uh, in my more cynical moments, I've asked whether or not, if you took that 30 million and concentrated it on the, the 5,000, and said, if you're homeless, you can have a voucher for £20,000. Mm. Um, you, can, you can hear all the objections yep. going back to the poor house. But if the homeless people were then able to pick whether they were helped by you or St Mungers mm. or mm. any of the others, uh, and done from the bottom up, we're quite happy to give students £9,000 a year and let them pick their university. Uh, is anybody think, experimenting in so, that area? So there have been experiments in that area. I mean, it's, it's, it's well known in terms of international development almost that one of, the, one of the things to do in response to poverty is to give people more money. And it's plain that that's an extremely effective, straightforward intervention, and that people with little money usually make very, very sensible decisions about what to spend that money on because they've been there and they've done that and they know the value of it. So giving money to people who have little is a sensible intervention. However, back to the 5,000, what we would say, in fact, the numbers of people on the street are very, very much the tip of an iceberg, much better conceived of. It's, being on the street is a very transient experience. Most people are in and out of other services, so the numbers are much bigger. And the amount of money you need to give someone in our society today, looking at the price of housing, which, for example, is the thing people would definitely need, would probably need to be quite a lot in order to make a difference to the numbers of people who are out there. So I think. It's, it's challenging. I think it's a sum I always do when they announce a big amount of money. How much would it be if we just gave this out to everybody? Because that would be the most straightforward. Um, however, because the, the rough sleeping numbers are really the tip of this much bigger iceberg, I think you'd find that the people flowing to the street would keep coming. You need, you need to think about what's causing that flow to the street, which, for example, is, is that 
unaffordability of private rented accommodation and the lack of social housing. And in the countdown to Christmas, and one of the points that you've made to me in the past is that perhaps it should be a countdown to the end of January, because at the end of January, as the Christmas hostels mm. and all the special facilities close, um, it is said that accident emergency and other services then see a spike of I people think, without support. I think is what, is I that mean, true? Ish. It's interesting. So uh, actually, the spike we tend to see more patients a bit later than that. What what you can human health is interesting in that if you do good for people, you have a long. If you invest in somebody, there's a sustained effect. So what, even if it, the, the investment put into people from the streets at Christmas really helps. So it's a really lovely thing to do, and it benefits lots of people. For people where the, the change has not been transformational in that you've got them off the street, that benefit lasts for some time until it, the, the effects begin to decay and they'll end up coming back to us. So it's not, it's not as simple as the winter projects close and they're back into hospital. The winter projects close and things begin to decay again. But yes, we, we would... Those, those winter opportunities, those Christmas opportunities are a great way to try and transform things in people's lives. But I guess it's always the old saying, yeah, the pet is for, for life, not just for Christmas. Homelessness is not just a Christmas phenomena. And although it's lovely to do good for people, it would be really nice to do it all the year round. And explain housing first and the international examples that that is based on. Where has the inspiration for that come? Um, because it's not originated in the UK. So Housing First is, is uh, as we, is that you, you could say that back in history, the idea of public housing, social housing, was a Housing First intervention. Um, these days, as with so many things, Housing First as a branded intervention comes from North America. We always slightly worry about the context because the levels of homelessness, particularly in the US, are so high that perhaps that context is, well, it is rather different to a British context. However, the thinking is that and it is a proper criticism of the UK system, existing models of, of helping people who are homeless tend to require people to engage with the service and gradually step up an escalator from an open, open access hostel with a fairly low level of support up to a, to a next level of provision, up to a self-supporting sheltered unit. And then if they're lucky and they've spent two years keeping their nose clean, they might be fortunate enough to be offered some housing. Yep. Housing First turns that on its head and says, says quite properly, this per one of this person's fundamental problems is the lack of a permanent, controllable, safe, secure home. Let's give them a home first, recognizing they're very likely to have lots of complex needs. And in the US, the pilots have tended to focus on people with, with the most complex needs, and that's where the benefits seem to be the highest. Let's give people with complex needs somewhere to live, which they obviously need, and then we will brigade the services around them that they need, but very much put them in control. They, the only deal is that they don't return to the street and it's their flat. They don't have to engage with any other services, although all the other services, if you do it well, are offered and very often people begin to make progress. So it does look, the evidence is very good. The UK context is a bit different to the US, so that's why we still need to see a little bit of experimentation, particularly around how those services around the individual are created. I think and the other big problem in London, back to cost, is that the cost of housing in London is so expensive, so it's difficult to create the number of units that you might need. Now, just explain the philosophy around inclusion, which is part of Pathways mission. It's also the faculty and the academics mm -hmm. that you work yeah. with, but that uh, simply fixing the health needs, making an economic intervention, a house over their head, while all these things are more than half full mm. of people could get them, the, the permanent solution involves this attitude or approach and this idea of inclusion. Just explain why you well, make such a profile of that. I get it, it comes partly from the academic work we've done, so with colleagues at UCL and, and all around the country, looking at the causality, looking at the way people root into particularly homelessness but other, other positions at the bottom of our society. What we find is that people's lives have been rubbish, have been mm, endlessly bad things have happened, and those have happened not for random events, but because of their context. And what's the very, very dominant theme of all of those events 
is a feeling for the individual of being excluded, of being marginalized, being excluded from school, literally, of being put at the back of the class, of being put in, a, in the dumb kids group at school, of being made to live in a squalid housing unit. If your parents are struggling, perhaps, perhaps you are temporarily accommodated, you'll be the family who endlessly have to move and therefore you have to move school. And those experiences, what, what we know is those experiences cause damage. There's the old saying, if it, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I love the way Michael Marmot turned that round and said, actually, that's fundamentally not true. What hurts you causes you long-term damage. And all those experiences in life cause damage to individuals. So the damage is very often psycho psychological damage, and it is the, the feelings which hurt people so much of feeling marginalized. Okay. So, so the, re the response has to be to try and find ways to so, include people. But not just the streets then. In the weekend newspapers reporting that some schools are excluding up to 25 percent yeah. of their pupils. Is that a ticking time bomb in Absolute, some areas? Yeah, absolutely. So th those kids one knows are, for, for many of them it may not be a, a deeply stressful event, but for some of them you're just adding another little, another little injury to their lives and another reason why feelings of self-worth might be damaged and why I might feel I'm not good enough and why I might begin to, to progress in a more negative way in life. So, so those, those figures are extremely worrying. And we know our education system is now forced into some pretty weird actions. And so thinking about the countdown to Christmas and the kind of traditional media stories that go in that countdown, do you feel confident that there is enough going on that this Christmas will be different? If not, it won't be perfect, but that you will be able to see a visible difference in the numbers and possibly the signs of innovation and solution-based approaches setting the seeds for the future? Are you an optimist or do you feel that the... I think I'd have to reserve my judgment. So there, there are some opportunities out there. There are some really, really good organizations and individuals trying their best to make, to make sensible things happen. I think thinking about colleagues in, in, the in the big national charities crisis and shelter, for example, they're focused on trying to shift, change the story a bit to try and validate the voices and perspectives of people from the streets and from, from those excluded experiences to say it is, we need to learn from those experiences what works and to engage people who have been there and done that to think about how to structure services. So that, that feels positive. Um, I think the ability of our nation state to mobilize the resources which have been allocated in sensible ways to allocate them where it's going to help. I'm not sure about the money announced so far. Looks like sticking plaster money. It looks like another set of pilots, which undoubtedly will do some good for some individuals, but then they may well go away again. And what we do need is a longer term focus on this issue, because as I said, I think it's perfectly feasible to see, you, see us abolishing it in 10 years, not, not reducing it by half. Do you think it's good that the three big mayors, London, Birmingham and Manchester, have sort of put themselves in the firing line on this and they're closer to the ground and they have people on the ground? Could that change it? I think it could, yes. So that, that's positive and we, we talk to some people around them. I think this, each of them have their challenges. Manchester perhaps have the greatest opportunity to, to get some strong integration between health, housing and social care because they've got a devolution deal around health care. But again, I know that's proving at a high level it sounds good, but the reality of trying to shift budgets and move services around mm. is always complicated. London has its particular challenges almost of scale. It's such a big city. The health system is so fragmented and complex. I think Sadiq has a challenge there. And again, money remains a challenge given the housing market in London. Um, the West Midlands, again, I think there are some real opportunities there. Yeah, so, so they could grab it and they could drive forwards, but, but the money remains a problem. Okay, Alex Bax, Chief Executive Pathway on the countdown to Christmas. Uh, challenging, but some optimistic signs. Uh, Alex, thank you very much. Thank you.